All dhammas are rooted in desire. It's a fascinating statement, one that's all too often overlooked. What it means is everything you experience starts with desire. The mind is not simply on the passive side of things. It's the more active side. It's out looking for things. You could also say the heart is out looking for things. The Buddhist tradition doesn't make a distinction between mind and heart. What this means is that your, your desires have their reasons. As I say, the heart has its reasons. Well, it's your desires have their reasons. They're out looking for something because they think something is worth looking for. A lot of our initial reasons are pretty, pretty raw. You're hungry. You need something to put away the pain of the hunger. And then as you get more and more experience, you have more and more reasons for why you're looking for something in particular. What kind of hunger, whether it's physical or mental, you're trying to feed. And this has its good and its bad side. The, the bad side, of course, is that hunger is often blind, or at least has blurry sight. And so you think something is satisfying, but it's not really. And you don't look at the long-term consequences of what you're doing. A lot of our desires are focused on a very narrow perception of things, blocking out huge areas of our experience. And we take it for granted that there's going to be a lot of stress and a lot of pain. And we learn how to turn a blind eye to it. And the Buddha is basically saying, no, don't. Step back from your desires. Unfortunately, because we have so many different desires, we can't step back. If you had just one desire, you just keep going and going and going and going. But the mind has been around long enough to realize there are a lot of different things worth wanting. This is where you get to the good sign. Because your desires have their reasons, you can actually re reason with some of them. When you can point out that this is not really worth it, that the effort that's put in looking for something entails way more pain than it does gratification. And if you offer an alternative, the mind will go for the alternative that's better. This is why we can train our minds. And this is what the Buddha's teachings are for, is to learn how to train our desires. Ultimately, as Ananda once told that Brahman, he wants to take us to a point where he can finally be beyond desire, because wherever the desire is, there's always a sense of lack. And that's built into the desire. He wants to take a place where there's no longer any sense of lack, where there is nothing lacking. But to get there, you have to cultivate your de skillful desires. That question, what might I do will lead to long-term welfare and happiness? That's basically giving guidance to your desires. One is telling you that there is such a thing as long-term happiness. This belief that the teaching on inconstancy means that things just come and go and come and go, so nothing's really lasting. It's just like waves coming in off the ocean. And so because you know a wave will come, well, it's going to go, so don't get upset about the waves, even the waves you don't like. That's not the Buddha's approach. He's basically saying there are long-term types of happiness, there's also long-term pain. So you want to be very careful about how you act. That realization is the beginning of hatefulness. And it's the realization that your actions are going to make a difference. That's also an important part of the discernment. They have their consequences, and you have your choice what to do. Then the Four Noble Truths give you even more guidance, point out the kind of desires that are not worth following, the desires for sensuality, desires for becoming, desires for non-becoming, i.e. you want to become a certain person in a certain world. And up to an extent, that's useful. 
but then you're going to reach the limitations of becoming. And as the Buddha discovered, if you want to destroy the kind of becoming you've got, it means you simply take on a new becoming of the destroyer. So you need a path that takes you through that conflict. That's what the Eightfold Path is all about. But that too has desire. And there will be a type of becoming involved with that desire. This is the desire to act skillfully, to give rise to skillful qualities that aren't there yet, and to maintain them and develop them when they are. And the desire to not allow unskillful things to arise and to abandon them if they do. So it's basically guidance for your desires. An important part of the path, of course, is concentration, which is what we're working on right now, is to put the mind in a position where it, it's got a good desire, and a desire that allows it to see clearly. Because most of our desires kind of rush past things, where here's the desire to settle down, just be very still. So you can meet, see these movements of the mind. The Ajans talk about them a lot. Lim Bodun talks about how the, the mind goes out, flows out. That's the cause of suffering. And John Lee talks about them as being the effluence. There's this desire that arises in the mind, and it goes flowing out and meets up with an object. And then it, the mind itself changes based on the desires it follows. And the world around it changes as well. You can see this. Someone, say, gambles a little bit, and it's no big deal, but then they start gambling more and more and more. They become a different person, and the world they live in becomes a different world. And on the positive side, you can start meditating a little bit, and it doesn't make much of a difference. But if you really dedicate yourself to it, you become a new person. People you used to like to hang out with, you don't particularly find that interesting anymore. And other people that you were not interested in before suddenly become more interesting. And so you want to be able to see this. And so getting the mind settled in right here gives you a good place to see it, because you've got something good to stay with right here. So when the option comes up to go someplace else, you can say, wait a minute, what am I going to lose if I leave this? Because otherwise, if you're in a bad situation and someone comes along and says, hey, come and join me. You don't, you're not too picky about the questions you ask, because you're not happy where you are, so you're willing to say, well, whatever. Which sometimes can be fortunate, and sometimes, often though, is not. But if you're in a good position and someone comes along and says, hey, let's, let's go down to the garbage dump, you say, no, I'm not so interested in that. So the Buddha's giving you a good place to stay. And because it's still, you can see the little movements of the mind, the ones that start out seeming kind of innocent, but then take on a different cast when you follow them. It's like that movie, The Gremlins. Those little fuzzy things, they look so nice. And they can eat you up. Or one of the few science fiction stories I read, where these explorers are going through a through a solar system, and they've got this meter on the on their rocket ship that tells you what are the inhabitants of this planet friendly or unfriendly. So they're approaching this one planet, and it was indicating that the inhabitants were very friendly. So they landed, and as they got closer and closer to the surface, the friendliness meter kept going higher and higher and higher, and finally they landed, and those little furry things came running around, climbing up the rockets, and then the meter was saying, really friendly, pegging out. So they opened up the doors, and the little furry things came in and ate them all up. In other words, things that seem friendly may be friendly because they <laughs> want to take advantage of you. So you've got to watch out for these little things in the mind, and that's what the concentration enables you to do, to see the little movements. And when you've had experience enough to know that, okay, this seems innocent to begin with, like little soft, fuzzy vines in one of the suttas, where this tree is 
got this seed that has landed. And the tree deva is kind of concerned, and the other devas come around and are even more concerned. But then they say, well, maybe, maybe it's not going to grow, and maybe it's a peacock will eat it, and maybe it's not even a seed to comfort the deva. And then the deva, as the, it is a seed and nothing eats it, and it starts growing. And the deva wonders, why is it that they were so ad, adamant comforting me? It's soft and tender, this, this vine coming on the tree. Of course, the vine grows and grows and grows and finally strangles the tree. So when you've had experience with vines like that, you want to be in a position where you know, okay, this is what the first signs are like. You've got to get rid of it. Concentration enables you to see that. And because you're well fed with the concentration, you can reason with your less skillful desires. And it's because they have their reasons that you can reason with them. There was that old split in ancient philosophy. Plato taught that desires had no reason at all, pure id, pure want, and reason had to beat them down. And the Stoics said, well, no, your desires have their reasons. This is why you can actually train them. In that case, the Buddhism sides with the Stoics. Your desires have their reasons but because they all want happiness. It's just that some of them are not all that skillful and not that clear-sighted. When you make the clear-sighted members of the mind more powerful, they can start understanding the tricks of the unskillful desires and reason with them. That's why the Buddha said you want to be able to see things as they rise, as they pass away, to see what sparks them. Because often what sparks them is something totally irrelevant. But you've made the connection. You feel this little funny feeling in your hand and this little funny feeling in the heart area or the stomach area. And you go for something right away. A particular line of thought, a particular type of action. And it's totally random that you've made that connection. And you want to see the randomness and the arbitrariness of that. That weakens the sense that this is inevitable. And you look at the desire passing away. Again, sometimes it just loses interest. Something else comes in. You forget. And you begin to see these things that are driving your life are really arbitrary. You just get a sense of being a little bit disillusioned with them. Then you look for the allure. Why is it you go for these things? And then you can compare them with the drawbacks. And see that the lure is pretty small and pretty blind. Well, the drawbacks are, can be pretty huge. And then you want to look for the escape. In some cases, concentration will be the escape. It'll give you the chance to find a better thing to do, a better thing to go for than what you've been going for in the past. And through concentration, then you can develop even deeper levels of dispassion for your old desires. So you're basically teaching your desires to have better reasons. You're teaching your heart to have better reasons. And working with the breath is a really good way of doing this. Not only gives you a state of concentration, but also helps you see how sometimes your desires hijack the energy in your body, put a squeeze on your nerves, as they say in Thailand. To make you do things that part of you knows are not all that skillful. But now you can resist the squeeze, fill out the breath energy in the body, and you've deprived your desires of one of their more underhanded tricks. So allow yourself to desire concentration, allow yourself to desire the practice, because that's desire on the good side. Because when the Buddha said all dhammas are rooted in desire, he meant both skillful and unskillful dhammas. The one thing that's not rooted in desire is nirvana. That lies outside. That's the ending of all dhammas. But to get there requires desire, requires, as 
Ananda says in another sutta, it requires conceit. Seeing that other people have done this, they're human beings, I'm a human being. They can do it, why can't I? Because that, of course, is one of the, another one of the tricks of your unskillful desire. You say, well, other people can do it, but you're not capable. So don't believe that. You are capable. The Buddha didn't teach anything that human beings can't do. If you have it within yourself, here's the opportunity. They talk about these currents flowing out of the mind as being like an ocean. Here's a lifesaver in the ocean for you. The ocean, of course, comes from your own currents flowing out, flowing out. But as the Buddha said, there is a shore beyond these currents, and he's offering you a raft to take you over. And the effort to go across, of course, requires a certain amount of desire. But once you've gotten to the other side, okay, you don't need those desires anymore. That's when it gets really good. <laughs>